All right, so today, guys, we're, we're using MATLAB, and so if you want to um, bring up MATLAB and download the starter code on, on Canvas, then um, you can follow along. Okay. So today, today is designed to be inter interactive, and so if you, uh, you know, it's designed for you to follow along in MATLAB. All right, see you, Joshua. Have a good weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> well, I won't see you. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. I always forget when people are multiple. Yeah. <laughs> I don't regret uploading the power bar for this since I'm going to make a PDF of it. Sign in. You can you can download it and open it in that. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's a starter script, and so you can uh, you can just open it up. So if you're just if you're just joining us, oh question. Oh good evening, Raphael. So if you're just joining us, uh, today's today's meant to be kind of an interactive kind of MATLAB day. And so uh, if you can open up MATLAB on your own computers, I've uploaded a starter code on uh, on Canvas. And so if you go to frame FEM code underscore starter, um, you go you can go ahead and download that. And then we'll be spending today uh, basically filling filling in this, this code. Yeah, we'll spend today and and maybe and maybe Monday, depending on how far how far we get. This as a live script or uh, just just as a regular script and so if you just open it up in, in matlab um yeah just just as a regular script is good
So for those of you who are just joining us on Zoom, uh, I know we have a couple minutes till class starts, but today is meant to be kind of an interactive MATLAB day. And so, um, you know, I've uploaded a starter code onto Canvas. And so if you go to our week six, week, week six page on Canvas, uh, you'll see at the bottom, there's a file called frame FEM code starter. And so if you can download that and open it up in MATLAB, you'll see that there's a lot of code there that we're gonna fill in. And so we're gonna spend today kind of going over the logic behind the code and, and filling in the parts. And so um, if you can start up MATLAB on your computer and open up the code, then um, you know, you'll be ready to go once, once we get to it. Okay, so we'll get started in about a minute. Let me increase the font. How is this project? References. Okay, it's uh, seven o'clock, so let's go ahead and start. Sorry for the uh, little technical difficulties. I opened up a program I, I, I shouldn't have. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. All right. Um, so if you're just if you're just kind of uh, coming into the lecture today, um, um, oh, a question. So do we keep any problem in homework in the homework two? Our, our uh, what do you talk? What do you um, what do you mean by that? Uh, professor, last last time I I saw on the video uh, the record like you said we we keep the num the homework three and B right correct oh yes yes uh, so so the very last problem on the frame 
uh, on the frame ones, it's like a bicycle frame problem. So that that one's optional. And so that one that one's a lot of work. Um, and so it's it's mostly just busy work. And so it I feel like it doesn't really teach you anything about frames. It just it's just it's just it's just another it's just modern day torture. And so I would rather not subject you guys to that. And so um, that was going to be optional. Um, Although you know the, the you. yeah so the so the final problem in the homework you know if you want to test your code on something that's going to be a great chance to do it because that problem is is you know it is it's 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 torture to do it by hand um, but it feels very empowering to do it by, with with MATLAB okay. um, so you know that's something that's something you can look forward to to using this code for okay um, but anyway, so if you're just joining us, you know today is a um, today is a uh, an, an interactive MATLAB day, and so we're going to be developing a code together. And so if you want to follow along, uh, if you go to the Canvas site and you go to our um, our our page for week six, you'll see that I've posted a starter code on there. And so you can go ahead and download that starter code, and then open up to MATLAB, and then we'll fill in all the all the missing parts uh, today. Okay. Um, so the plan for today is just to be, we're going to be in MATLAB the whole time. And so we're going to be discussing that code. We're going to be discussing the, uh, the data containers and the logic um, and everything that goes inside it. Okay? And so the hope is that by the end of today, if not today, then we'll finish it up on Monday. You'll have a working code that you can solve for any frame problem um, that's out there. Okay. Which is, uh, which is exciting. All right. So are there, uh, are there any questions I can answer before we, uh, before we begin today? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. So we we had kind of already started talking about this last uh, uh, last lecture. Okay. Um, and so you know we've already used the direct stiffness method to solve you know all kinds of problems. And so even though we've done all these by hand, you know I think I speak for everyone when I say that these are these are kind of a pain in the butt to, to do. Okay. Um, and so what we're going to do instead is we're going to write a MATLAB code to kind of automate all this for us. Okay. And so even though, and so if you, if you look at the code right now, you know, it's, it is, it's, it's not a, uh, um, it's not a light code. And so it's, it's quite the chunker, um, you know, by itself, right? So I believe the, the line count was like 230 lines. So not, not the longest program in the world, but also not, not trivial at all. Okay? Um, so even though it, it, it looks like it's quite a lot of code to write, you know, what you'll see is that it's going to follow the exact same logic that we've, that we've followed so far. Okay. And by logic, I mean the, the finite element solving process. And so we're going to be computing the element stiffness matrices. We're going to be performing assembly. We're going to be applying boundary conditions. Um, and then we're going to be solving the, the system after that. Okay. And just like any code, you know, it takes some time to implement. It takes, it takes some work to get it going. Um, but once you get it going, then you can, the, the great thing about code is that you can apply it to lots of different kinds of problems. Um, and I designed this code, you know, um, I, I structured this code with that in mind that you can take this code and use it to run any kind of frame problem that's out there, which is, which is really cool. Okay. And so, um, you know, just like we talked about on, on Monday, you know, the biggest leap in logic or the biggest, uh, um, you know, leap that we're going to make here is, is through the use of our data containers, or in other words, our variables. Okay. Uh, so make sure you're kind of paying, paying attention to that. And if, and if something doesn't make sense with the data containers, you know, just please let me know uh, because it's, that's kind of a key, that's kind of a key point that we're going to be, uh, that's, that's going to kind of, everything's going to build off the data containers. And so, you know, if, there, if, if we define a variable and you're not really sure what it looks like or, you know, what you can visualize from it, then, you know, then just let me know. And, you know, we'll, we'll go and explain it because that's, that's going to be important for it. Okay. And so throughout today, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be using the code with the intent to solve this frame problem here. And so, you know, I think this is one of the examples that we did in class with the frames. And so it's a three, it's a three element system. And so we have uh, three frame elements and we have four nodes. Okay. And so each of the elements is given, uh, you know, given there, okay. Where the Young's modulus is 30 times 10 to the six PSI. They have a cross-sectional area of 10 inch square. Uh, the length of each element is 120 inches. Um, the moment of inertia of the elements one and three is 200 inches fourth, inch to the fourth, and the moment of inertia of uh, element two is 100 inches to the fourth. Okay. Uh, so these are important. So make sure, make sure you know if you have your pencil and paper with you, you know if you want to write down these uh, these properties down, then you know uh, for each element, then that'll be useful. Uh, we have their orientation angles here. So the orientation angle for element one is 90 degrees. For element two, it's zero. And for three, it's 270. 
and we have fixed supports on nodes one and four. Okay, so that's going to knock out all of the degrees of freedom on nodes one and four. And we have our forces being applied on node two. We have a horizontal force there, and we have a moment being applied on node on node three. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll be returning to this to this uh, to this problem here several times, you know, because as we fill in the code, we're going to need to know what the properties and, and everything uh, else is. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. Okay. All right. So first thing, first things first. And so let's look at the very top of the code, and you'll see that there are two lines there that define uh, the number of elements in in the uh, in your system and the number of nodes. Okay. Um, and so this is the first thing that you have to define because you know before we can do really do anything in the code. You know, the code has to know how many elements, how many nodes that we have. Okay. And so let's go back to our example problem here. You can see here we have three elements and we have four nodes. Okay. Um, and so very first thing, let's go ahead and fill that in into the code. And so, you know, you'll see that for, you'll see that, you'll see that I use this convention quite a bit where, where when I want you to fill something in, I use the, uh, I use the tagline to do. Okay. And so whenever you see to do, that means I want you to do, to do something. Okay, so let's go ahead and fill that in. And so the number of elements here um, is three, right? So we have three elements and the number of nodes is four, okay. right? It's very straightforward. And so that's kind of the first thing, uh, first thing that, we can, that we can do, okay? Okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just do this mode just because it's easier to switch, okay? All right. And so the reason the reason we're doing this is because a lot of the data containers and a lot of the other variables that we're going to specify depend uh, depend on the number of nodes and the number of elements that we that we have. Okay. okay. So here here we here we're going to talk about uh, you know one one concept that might be uh, you know that might take a little bit of time to explain, and that's the connectivity. Okay. And so now that we've defined the the number of elements and the number of nodes in the system. We have to tell MATLAB, but we have to tell the code how they're all connected to each other. Okay. And so if we recall, you know, when we when we do these problems by hand, you know, we, we did this by um, indicating uh, in our element stiffness matrices which nodes that they're connected to, right? And so you know, our element stiffness matrices would look like this, right? So we'd fill in the, the matrices here. Okay. And then we put the, the nodal entries right next to it. Okay. And so by, by doing this, we, we basically tell ourselves that, you know, this element, well, let's say it's element A, element A is connected to nodes one and two, okay? And that information was really important for us, you know, once, uh, once we went to go, um, you know, to assemble, just to make sure that all the elements get put in the right places, okay? Um, and so we have to do this explicitly for the, uh, for the code, okay? And so we have to basically define um, how the elements are connected to each of the nodes, okay? And the way we do this is through what's called a connectivity matrix. Okay, and so if you scroll down in the code a little bit, you'll see that I have a line here called connectivity. Okay, and so that's this line right here. And so this connectivity is is going to define, um, you know, how how the elements are connected to the nodes. Okay, and the way they work is is uh, the way it works is is uh, um, you know. Um, in, in hindsight, I think once you understand it, it's, it's very straightforward, but you know, I think the first time you see it, it might be a little bit strange, okay? And so the first thing to note here is the size of this matrix, okay? And so you can see that it's a matrix because we have two entries here, okay? And you can see here that the, the first uh, entry that we have here is number of elements, right? And since we're defining a matrix, that means that this, this first entry right here defines the number of rows that we have. And so that means we're going to have one row in this connectivity matrix for each element that we have in our um, in our system. Um, and so since we have three elements, that means our connectivity matrix is going to have three rows. Okay. okay. Uh, next, what you'll see is that the number of columns that we have is a fixed number. And so the number of columns is two. Okay. And that's set to be uh, very deliberate. And so what that tells us is that the uh, and the reason we have that is you know. Each of our elements, if I can kind of go back to this image right here, 
each of our elements here is connected to two nodes, right? And so element one here is connected to nodes one and two, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our connectivity matrix to define you know, what nodes each element is connected to, okay? All right, and so as an example, you know, let's say, let's take element two in our problem, right? So element two is connected to nodes two and three, okay? And so we need to encode that information into our, into our program, right? And so if we go to our connectivity matrix and we go to the second row, okay? And so to tell the program that element two here is connected to nodes two and three, we put a two in the first entry and a three in the second one, okay? Right, so our connectivity matrix for this problem looks something like this. We have three rows because we have three elements and we have two columns. Okay, so this is node one and this is node two, okay? And so since uh, element two is connected to nodes two and three, we would have a two there and a three, okay? And so to implement this in our MATLAB code, you know, you could see here that we're defining the matrices kind of element by element, okay? And so, you know, to implement this, we can see here that our entry two comma one, right? So this is the second row of the first column. This is gonna be two. Okay? And our entry in the second row and the second column, this has to be three. All right, and so you know, based based on that logic and based on the problem that we have here, um, go ahead and fill in the rest of the of the connectivity matrix and go ahead and implement that in your code as well. Okay, so I, I have the answer here on the next slide, um, but understanding kind of the logic of this connectivity matrix is is important for us going forward. Okay, and so I'll go ahead and give you like a, just maybe like a minute to go ahead and fill that in, um, and then we'll we'll check the answer together after that. So for you guys just coming in, we're, we're doing an interactive MATLAB day. And so if you want to go ahead and raise the computers, um, it, it would help to kind of fill in the code along, along with this. So I posted I posted the starter code on Canvas and so you just download and, uh, and get started. So we, we barely start, so you guys, you guys can kind of catch up, no problem. Right. And so let's go ahead and fill in the rest of the connectivity matrix here. And so we have element one. And so element one here is connected to nodes one and two. And so, you know, we're going to put a one right there and a two right there. Okay. And then element three here is connected to nodes three and four. So we'd have a three here and a four there. Okay. And so to implement this in the code, you know, we would go to this, uh, this entry right here. So connectivity one comma one, this would be a one. Connectivity one comma two, this would be a two. Connectivity three comma one, this is a three. And connectivity three comma two, this is a four. Okay. And if we go to the slides, you can see here that I have the slide right here. You can see that our connectivity matrix is exactly that. Okay. okay, and so if you want to check, if you want to check to make sure that your code um, has saved that, uh, saved that properly, you can go ahead and run it. Um, it's not going to run completely. And so, you know, because we still have all these to do's, it's going to run into an error. Okay. And so there's the error sound, but it did define the connectivity matrix for us. And so if you double click on connectivity right here from the workspace, you could check the values that you have on the inside. Okay. And you can see here, uh, when I double click connectivity, that the um, solution here is one, two, two, three, three, four. So exactly as we, exactly as we specified it. All right, so that's the connectivity matrix, and so we'll we'll come back to this once we get to assembly. And so this and so this information is going to be important to us because uh, after we construct the element stiffness matrices for all the elements, we have to insert them into the correct um, correct spots into the global into the global linear system. Okay, and so this connectivity information will be important important. All right, any questions on any questions on this? Okay. 
And so this connectivity is, is you know, like I said, it's, it's not something that's unique to just this program. And so, you know, the standard, the standard format, um, you know, for storing mesh information. And so if you remember back from, you know, when we were using ANSYS, um, you know, we, we produced a mesh for our geometry, you know, that mesh also knows its connectivity information. And so, you know, knowing which elements are, which nodes are connected to which elements uh, is essential information to, um, you know, for meshes. Okay. All right, so now that we now that we specify the connectivity information, the next step is going to be the material and geometric properties. Okay, and so if we go back to our uh, to our problem here, if we go back to our problem. You can see that all of the frame elements here have a lot of properties that they that they need to store, and so we need to know what their Young's modulus is. We need to know what their area is, their lengths, their moment of inertia. We do need to know their orientation angle. Okay. And so we need to encode all this information into, into MATLAB, okay? And so the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna store it in a vector, just like, just like before. Okay. okay, and so if you go into the code, you can see here that I have uh, a bunch of code segments here, okay? And so if you start at line 18, you can see here that I have a line here to specify the Young's modulus for each of the elements. Okay. And you can see here that I, I've, de I've defined this new vector here of EPROP, uh, which is a zeros vector. Uh, with a number of elements, comma one, okay? And so this is a single vector with only a, a single column. Um, and it's gonna specify, you know, here's where we're gonna specify the Young's modulus for each of the elements, okay? And I have the same thing for the area, same thing for the moments of inertia, same things for the length, and same things for the theta, okay? And so the way these lines of codes work is that you're, you're basically just gonna fill in, uh, fill in the uh, appropriate amount of properties here. Okay, so let's take let's take let's take the, the the moment of inertia first. Okay, so moment of inertia I think is interesting because it's, it's different, right? And so for moment of inertia, you can see here that for the first and third element, we have a moment of inertia of two hundred. Okay, and so to implement that in the code, you know, you can see here that we've I prop it one, and so this is referring to the first element here, and so to assign that a moment of inertia of two hundred, we just put a two hundred there. For the third element, um, you know, we would uh, put a, a 200 there as well. And so that's the, that's the third moment of inertia. And then for the second one, we put a 100 there. Okay? And so this is simply just listing out the properties. Okay? And so we're just kind of defining what's, we're just kind of writing down basically what's given to us in the problem. Yeah. It's a typo, it should be four. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so um, and so that's how we define the properties here. And so I've, I've already kind of defined all the appropriate lines for you. And so all you have to do here is fill it in. Okay? And so why don't you guys go ahead and, and go ahead and fill that in. And so you're gonna need to fill in the Young's modulus and the, and the lengths, okay? And so I think those should be easy because they're all the same for every element, okay? Um, oh, excuse me, and the areas as well, okay? And so we have area, um, we have Young's modulus, we have area, we have lengths. Okay, so go ahead and fill all those in, uh, but don't fill in the angles yet. And so for the angles, we uh, we're going to do that, um, you know, in a in a in a in a in a in a certain way. Okay, but go ahead and fill in the the Young's modulus, the areas, and the lengths for all of the elements. And I will do that in parallel with you.
All right. So was everyone able to fill in all the all the properties? Okay. So pretty pretty straightforward, right? So remember remember one thing you can do in do in MATLAB um, is you can use the e notation. And so uh, if you have like 30 times 10 to the 6, you can just say 30 E6 and that and that saves you a lot of typing. Okay, so now we come to the orientation angles. And so this is, uh, uh, you know, these we're just going to fill in as well, but uh, we have to be a little bit careful how we do this. Okay? And so later on in the code, later on in the code, we're going to use the built-in sine and cosine functions in that. Right. So why, why am I mentioning that? And so I'm mentioning that because by default, when you use the sine and cosine function in, in MATLAB, what they expect is that the arguments be in radians. Okay. And so if you want to, if you want to continue using the sine and cosine, um, you know, then you would have to input the, the degrees here in radians as well. Okay. And so we can go ahead and do that. And so for uh, element one here, element one, the uh, rotation angle for that is 90. And so we convert that to radians. 90 is pi over two. Okay. For the second element, the second element is has a rotation angle of zero. And so we're going to put a zero there. Okay. And then for element three, we have a rotation angle of three of 270. And so we can do three pi, three pi divided by two. Yes, yeah. So Tristan, so Tristan brings up a good point in the chat. And so uh, another thing that you could do, if you if you do want to use degrees, is that you can input these as degrees. And so you can put these as 90, um, 0, and 270. So I, I just learned about the existence of sine d and, and cosine d recently. Okay. And so another way you can do this is that you can you can define these as degrees, but later on in, the, in your code, when you have cosine and sine, instead of cosine and sine, you have cosine d sine d okay and so that's the matlab default function for taking the degrees version of cosine and sine instead of the sine version so i think that's the only place where i have sine and cosine and so you know if you want to do that you can change the code later on to be cosine d sine d um, or you can do it in terms of radians and so either either way either way will work yeah but just for the sake of you know um of this is kind of how i had it before uh, I'm going to do it in terms of in terms of radians, but if you want to do it degrees, then that's that's fine too. Just make sure you make the appropriate changes to um, uh, line 72, line 73 to be cosine d sine d. So either either way works. Just make make sure you stick to make sure you stick to uh, stick to a method. Um, okay. Any questions? Yeah. So, so Oh yeah, yeah. You can do any kind of uh, any kind of uh, permutation on this um, as well. Yeah. I think that's how I originally had it too, because you know, for ninety two seventy, it's easy to remember. But if you had something like thirty six degrees or something like that, then that's hard to kind of come up with the radius off the top of your head. And so you can you can you know uh, put the appropriate formulas for that too, or we can just use cosine d sine. So lots of different ways to uh, lots of different ways to uh, uh, to implement this bad boy. Okay. okay. All right, so that's uh, material properties, and so those are more or less pretty straightforward. And so you know, um, once you kind of you know fill those in, you know, that's basically just kind of copying data from the problem. And so that's that's not too bad. Okay, next we have boundary conditions, and so I have quite a few slides on this because it's um, you know um, boundary conditions is is another thing where you can kind of um, implement this in in a in your own kind of way, uh, and from a lot of the codes that I've seen, people kind of do this a little bit differently. Uh, but this is kind of just my own convention. So I'm going to give that disclaimer right now that, uh, you know, this is kind of the Justin way of, of, of doing this, but, but it's, it's not a bad way. And so, you know, it's, it's not in any way non-standard. And so it, it is kind of a standard way. It's just kind of my own twist on, on the standard. Okay. And so let me give a little bit of context first. And so, you know, when we're, when we're defining our boundary conditions, you know, first of all, we have to know which degrees of freedom that we're, that we're going to be constrained. Okay, and so first, you know, first of all, I'm kind of talking about our um, um, our Dirichlet, actually, and our Neumann boundary conditions as well. Okay, and so another way that you can say this is that you know we need to know, you know, when we're applying boundary conditions, which rows in our global linear system uh, that we're applying our boundary conditions for. 
Okay. Uh, and then for our Neumann boundary conditions specifically, we also need to know um, the value of what the of what those boundary conditions um, are as well. Okay. And so we have a specific load value. We need to know what that value is. Okay. Um, and so you know this could be a little bit tricky, uh, you know, for for especially for larger systems, because every node has three degrees of freedom, right? And so for every node, remember we we we're solving for a ux, we're solving for a uy, and we're also solving for a rotation theta. Okay. So every node has has these three things, okay? and so it makes it a little bit difficult. And so, you know, if we're if we're saying that we're you know. In this particular problem, we're applying a Neumann bound, uh, a, a mode, uh, excuse me, a, 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 a moment on node three, okay? What row in the matrix does that correspond to, right? And so that's that's not a, uh, you know, you need to think about that a little bit, okay? Um, and so this part, you have to kind of be careful about, about, you know, how you specify the boundary conditions. All right, and so, and so a useful formula that I like to keep is, is something like this, okay? And so if you are supplying a boundary condition on a specific degree of freedom, okay? Uh, let's say that you're, let's say that, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, the moment on node three. What you could do is to say that, okay, because I'm supplying a moment on node three, that means I'm gonna be supplying a boundary condition on um, the rotational degree of freedom of node three, okay? And so to find out what row in the matrix that's gonna be in, I can plug it into this formula right here, okay? Where I here is the is the is the node number, okay. And so for the example that I'm saying, so the um, for node three would plug in i is equal to three here, okay. And so we have um, three minus one, which is two. We multiply that by three, and so that's uh, six. And then we add three to that, and so that's going to be nine, okay. All right. And so would, if we were to supply a boundary condition on the rotational component of node three, then that would be at the ninth row in the matrix, okay? And so this is something that, you know, you, you guys have kind of been doing by hand, just kind of naturally, um, you know, because just, just kind of based on the, based on the labels of your global, um, you know, linear system. And so all that we're doing now is that we're gonna, we're kind of making it a little bit more systematic where we're gonna be actually computing what those rows, what those rows actually are. Um, so, uh, any questions on this? Does this kind of make sense about how we how we're doing this and kind of why we're doing this? Okay. Right. So, I think it'll make more sense once we kind of um, work on it. Okay. okay. And so, let's start with the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So, the Dirichlet boundary conditions, you know, we're we're applying fixed constraints on nodes one and four. Okay. And so that means that the x displacement, the y displacement, and the rotational degree freedoms for nodes one and four are going to be completely constrained. So they're going to be set to zero. Okay. And so let's compute. Let's compute which rows in the matrix correspond to these degrees of freedom. Okay. And so for node one, for node one, you know, node one is pretty easy. And so that's just going to be the first three rows in the matrix, right? And so that's going to be the u one x row, the u one y row, and the theta one row. Okay. Uh, and then we have the, and then we have the, uh, you know, the constraints on node four. And so node four, that's going to be the last three rows of the matrix, right? And so if we use our formula here, um, this tells us that we need to constrain row 10. And so row 10 is going to be for u4x, row 11 is going to be in u4y, and then row 12 is going to be for theta four, okay? And so, and so with these indices in mind, you know, we need to tell, we need to tell MATLAB that these rows are going to be constrained in our in our equations, okay? And so if we go to our code here, okay, you'll see if you look at line fifty three here, I have a variable here called uh, DIRBC index, okay. If you look at if you read the tooltip here, then uh, what we're doing is we're specifying the variable numbers. Another word for variable numbers is row numbers, okay. We're specifying the row numbers where we're applying our Dirichlet boundary conditions, okay. And so let's go ahead and use the um, use the information from the slides, okay? And so that's going to be rows one, two, and three. And so let's do one, comma two, comma three, okay? And then in addition to that, we're gonna we need to constrain rows ten, eleven, and twelve. And so let's put that in here as well. So it's going to be ten, comma, eleven, comma.
Okay. So keep it. So keep in mind at this point, you know, we, we haven't actually done anything. Um, it's we haven't actually done any solving or applications of the boundary conditions. We're just kind of setting up. We're kind of setting up the data so that the rest of our code can can read. Okay. All right. So that kind of makes sense about how about why we kind of set these um, these six values in this in this vector the way they are. This is mostly so that we could refer to it later in the code to actually specify these boundary conditions. But we need to specify which rows that they are. Kind of in this kind of in this upper portion of the code. Okay, all right. So that's the uh, so that's the um, you know the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now let's do the same thing for uh, for the Neumann boundary conditions. Okay, and so for the Neumann boundary conditions, we have two we have two modes that are being applied. And so we have a load, um, you know, we have a load a horizontal load on node two. Okay, and we have a rotational load on node three. Okay. And so in the Noi BC index, we're going to put in uh, four for the first entry, okay? because that's the U the U4 the U2x um, row of the matrix or the F2x row. Okay. And we also need the row for M3. And so the M3 row is going to be nine, right? Again, using that formula that we had before for the boundary conditions, which is uh, this one right here. Okay. And so to get four, what I did was I plugged in i is equal to two. And so, because uh, it's the second node into this formula right here, okay? And so we have three times two minus one, which is three plus one, which is four. Okay? And then we did the theta component for, for node three as well. All right, and so in addition to this, we have to uh, define the, the values of the, of the loads here, okay? All right, so if we go back to the example, uh, the example problem here, you can see that our load in the x direction has a um, has a magnitude of ten thousand, whereas our moment has a magnitude of five thousand. So let's go ahead and apply that in our code here. Okay. okay and so we have a horizontal load of ten thousand and a counterclockwise moment of five thousand there. Okay. Any questions on, on any of this so far? All right, so remember, we're, we're still kind of in the phase where we're inputting data from the problem. So we haven't, we haven't actually done any, uh, any logic or any programming yet. And so we just, uh, we're just kind of inputting, inputing data here, okay? All right, so we're gonna get to that very soon, okay? And so the next, the next thing that we're going to do here is we're going to uh, create matrices to store all the data that we're gonna produce, okay? And so the first thing we have here is K global. And so K global here is our global stiffness matrix. Okay. Okay. And you can see here that the that the uh, dimensions of this matrix, I have n nodes times three, comma n nodes times three. Okay. Um, and so for this particular problem, since we have four nodes, each of the four nodes is going to have three degrees of freedom. And so that means we're going to need to have 12 rows and 12 columns. Right? And so if n nodes is equal to four, then we have four times three is 12. And so we have 12 by, by 12, okay? okay? So by that same token, we have F glob here. So F glob here is our global forcing vector, okay? And so that's where we're gonna put in all of the boundary conditions and the, and the, nodal, and the loads, okay? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can explain that again. Yeah. So, so, so the four nine here um, came as a result of our where we're going to place our loads, right? And so this Noi BC index was, um, you know, this is basically telling the the MATLAB code. Um, this basically tells us which rows tells which rows we need to apply our loads. Okay, and so you can see here from the example problem that we have a horizontal load of 10,000 being applied on node two, okay? And so this means, this means that F2X is gonna be equal to this 10,000 right here, okay? Right. And so similarly, the, uh, the other load that we're applying is a rotational load or a moment on node three, okay? And so this tells us that M3 is equal to 5,000. 
Okay. And so when we go to, you know, normally when we're when we're solving these problems by hand, you know, we, we don't apply these until kind of the very, very end. Okay. And so the way that we usually do these is that you know we have our our vector here. Okay. And so here we have f1 x, f1 y, m1, f2 x, f2 y, and dot dot dot, right? And so when we go to apply these boundary conditions, we would need to plug in, you know, let's say for this one, F2Y is equal to 10,000, right? And so all we're doing right now is we're telling MATLAB, you know, which row that we're, that we're applying this in, right? And so that's why for the first run, I have a four. And then for the other one, I have a nine because the, because the horizontal row is going to go in row four and the moment of 5,000 is going to go in row nine. Um, yes, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. You do care about positive or negative. And so, if if this was a uh, if this was a uh, a negative going in the opposite direction, this would be a minus ten thousand. And similarly, if this was a clockwise moment, this would be a minus five thousand. Yep. Right. Yes. Yeah. So Tristan, Tristan is is absolutely correct. And so it's it's definitely best to set your coordinate system. And then stay consistent with that coordinate system. And so, in, in this problem, the coordinate system is given to us here. Okay. And so, um, and so, we're going to respect that coordinate system kind of all throughout. Okay. All right. And so that's the that's the boundary conditions. And then we also have our uh, you know our global our global stiffness matrix. Okay. And so the I think the the thing that's kind of confusing here is the data structure that we're using for the element stiffness matrices. Okay. And so you can see here I have I have three indices here, which is which is interesting because normally normally when you when you use the zeros function, you only use you know either one or two um, dimensions here. Okay. And so the fact that I have three dimensions here means that we're creating a three dimensional. This is kind of a three dimensional matrix. And so it has it has rows, it has columns, but it also has depth. Okay. Uh, so this so kind of visualizing this might be a little bit confusing. Okay. Uh, but but look at how look at how I've kind of designed the uh, the dimensions for this. Okay? And so first you could see that I've used a um, you know I've used six here six and six. And so the reason I have six and six there is because our element stiffness matrices have six rows and six columns, right? Because we're working with frames here. And so our element stiffness matrices look like, look like this, right? So we have six rows and six columns. And so that's why I have six and six there. Okay. But remember, you know, we need to compute an element stiffness matrix for every single element. And so, you know, I add an extra dimension here so that we can store all the element stiffness matrices that we need. And so for this particular problem, we have three, we have three elements, right? And so we need to compute three element stiffness matrices. And so, you know, that's why this is three. And so to kind of give you a visualization about how this kind of works, think of it as, as almost like a, like a filing cabinet, right? And so a filing cabinet, you know, we have our files here, right? And if you think of each individual file as like an element stiffness matrix, then each of those element stiffness matrices are going to be stacked on top of each other and kind of like the file the file cabinet okay um, and so the way the code is going to proceed is that we're going to compute each element stiffness matrix individually and then we're going to stuff that matrix into its filing cabinet where kind of the the way that we reference the, the filing cabinet you know is through this kind of extra index that we have here okay and you'll and you'll see us kind of make use of it kind of very very soon in the next loop where we actually compute the, the, the element stiffness matrices. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on uh, any questions on that? Okay. All right. So now let's let's get to the actual programming now. So you know we've 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 kind of just been spending time just defining our data structures. Now we actually need to actually do some computation. Okay. Um, and so this is the kind of the part in the, you know, if you kind of, you know, track your code along with kind of your usual kind of um, um, approach when you're solving these finite element problems, this will be the part where you compute your element stiffness matrices, okay? All right, and so to do this, you know, we're going to visit every single element in our system, and the way we're going to do this is with the for loop, and we're going to compute each entry in the element stiffness matrix, okay? 
And so since our element synthesis matrices are six by six, that means we're going to have 36 computations to do. Okay. And so a lot of this code is going to be, uh, you know, computing this element stiffness matrix. Okay. All right. And so if you go into the, the starter code that I gave you um, and you kind of move down, you know, starting on line 69, you know, this is where, you know, a lot of the code is going to take place. And so a lot of the computations are going to be, are going to take place here. Okay. Uh, so I've already, I've already kind of started this for you just to kind of give you a sense of for what it's like. Okay. And so let's kind of break this down kind of section by section. Okay. All right. So let's look at this section first. And so uh, line 71 through 73. Okay. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm computing the sine and cosine um, of this particular element. Okay. And so remember, you know, because we're using a loop, you know, we're, we're doing this kind of element by element. And so, you know, once you kind of enter the loop, you can kind of think of this as, you know, we're only dealing with one element at a time, right? And so since we're only dealing with one element at a time, you know, we need to compute what the sine and cosine of the, of that angle is, okay? And so for element one, for instance, right? So on the first iteration of the loop, the first, the first, the first time down the loop, you know, we're going to be dealing with the first element, okay? And so we need, we need to obtain what the angle of that element is, okay? And so we're going to take the, um, the theta prop, which is our vector here that's, uh, that's, that has our angle information, our rotational information. And so we're going to obtain the first entry in that, uh, in that vector, and then we're going to compute the cosine of that angle, okay? And then we're going to do the same as sine, with sine. And then just to kind of make our, just to make our code a little bit neater, I'm going to save these in variables called C and S. So very, very similar to how, um, how our computations are, are defined. Okay. And so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to retrieve all the material properties. And so I'm going to retrieve the Young's modulus for this element. I'm going to retrieve the area for this element, the uh, moment of inertia, as well as the length. Okay. And so I'm going to retrieve those from their, from their respective um, data containers. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to start computing the element stiffness matrix. Okay. And so let me go ahead and pull this up. Okay. And so here's our element stiffness matrix for a frame. And so, you know, if you, if you've been doing the homework, you know, you probably hate this thing with a burning passion. Um, and so now's your chance to kind of automate the whole thing so that you may kind of MATLAB do, do it for you. Okay. And so just like we kind of do in class, we're going to build up this element stiffness matrix kind of row. We're going to build it up row by row. Okay. And so this first row in the matrix here is has you know, all of these entries, okay? And I've already kind of written the first row for you, okay? And so if you read this comment here, you know, it can see here that we're, we're building up the first row of the element stiffness matrix for the frame, okay? And I do it kind of element by element, right? And so look at the indices that we're applying here. And so you can see here that all of the, all of the first entries for these, for these lines of code are all one, okay? And so that indicates that we're, that we're working with the first row in the matrix, okay? And then we're going to run across the columns. And so we're going to do it kind of, you know, each column entry. Okay? And so this first line of code here is for the first column. And so the first column, you can see from the map, from the uh, PowerPoint here that the entry is A times cosine squared plus 12 times I divided by L squared multiplied by S squared. Okay. And if you go back to the MATLAB code, you can see that I've implemented that in code exactly here. Okay. So I have A times cosine squared plus 12 times I divided by L squared times sine squared, okay? And I do the same thing for each of the other entries. Okay? And you can kind of check, you can kind of check this just to make sure that each, each of these lines of code correspond to the correct entry in the, in the element series matrix. Okay? And so I know what some of you are, are thinking right now. And so I know that, I know that there is an E over L here that's out in the front, okay? Uh, but we'll deal with that later. And so, you know, we're, once we kind of compute everything in the matrix, um, we're just going to multiply the whole thing by E over L. And so don't worry about that yet. Um, and so uh, for now, what I want you to do is I want you to fill in all the other entries in this, in this matrix, okay? Okay, and so you can see how I did the first row here. And so now you can do the, the other rows. Okay. okay, so go ahead and fill in the, go ahead and start with the second row. And so uh, you can go ahead and fill in the entries for the second row, okay? Um, but kind of ignore this first line right here, okay? So line 90, you can see here that I, I've kind of did something. And so I'll explain this in a bit, but first, uh, why don't you just because you know I've been kind of talking for a while, so um, you know go ahead and uh, go ahead and fill in the rest the rest of the of the second row, and I'll go ahead and do that kind of right along right alongside you.
if you're watching me type right now, you, you, you can see here that I'm, I'm very parentheses happy in MATLAB. And so I, I use a lot of parentheses. And so I know it's, uh, it's kind of overkill. And so I know some people will kind of say that it's kind of ugly, but um, you know, when I, when, I, when I type things in MATLAB, I, leave, I like to leave nothing to chance. And so you know, I want MATLAB to make sure that it, it does the operations in the order that I want. And so to do that, I have to do, you know, um, I add, that's why I add all these parentheses. I blame this on my childhood because I never properly learned the, uh, the order of operations. So how's everyone doing? Everyone got the second row, second row down. So we're gonna okay. I'll give you I'll give you a minute, a couple minutes. Wait, what? <laughs> I guess I, I've I've done this a couple of times before. Yeah, yeah. No, take take your time. I'll I'll give you a couple more minutes. So you're talking about line 90 right here? Exactly, right. And so, um, you know, remember our element stiffness matrix here is symmetric. And so, you know, kind of like what we did, um, you know, for, um, you know, when we write these out by hand is that once we complete the first row, you know, what we like to do is we like to write this into the first column. And so one way that we can do that is that, you know, what we can say that now that we have the one, two entry here, right? And so we have the element stiffness matrix at one comma two, then that's going to be the same thing as the element stiffness matrix at two comma one. Okay. And so what I did here was I said k element at two comma one is equal to k element at one comma two. Okay. And you can see here I did the same thing for row number three as well. Okay. And so I'm going to go ahead and fill that in for the rest of these. Okay. Make sure you include the i uh, underscore l, okay. i underscore el. And if you've already done with uh, with this, then you can go ahead and fill in fill in the rest. I do want to talk about assembly a bit today, and so I, I'll probably only hang I'll, I'll probably only hang out here for for a bit. And so if you don't if you don't finish writing in all these in, then you know don't worry about it. Um, you know this is something you can kind of fill in uh, fill in a bit later. But um, I'll give you guys maybe like four more minutes, and then we'll move on and talk about assembly. I think probably we'll, we'll have to finish this up on Monday, and so we'll talk about assembly. And then we'll we'll talk about boundary conditions on Monday, 
uh, in addition to our ANSYS activity. And so Monday, I, I have another ANSYS activity planned, uh, but it's not, it's not gonna take the whole time. And so, you know, I think we can, we can finish up this MATLAB code, make sure we talk about it kind of properly, um, and then we'll do the ANSYS activity after that. That's when I wake up to. One more for me. Okay. All right. All right. So don't don't worry about don't worry too much about you know filling these in exactly. I know I know it kind of takes a while to copy these over, um, but you know it's all it's all in the um, um, in the interest of automation. Uh, yes. Yeah. So for the homework um, problem three, you only have to do part A. Yeah. Part B. Part B is optional. You can do it if you if you feel like uh, torturing yourself for an hour, but uh, but it's not uh, it's not required. Can we do it on MATLAB? You can, yes. And so if you if you finish if we finish implementing this code, you can give it a try with uh, with that, um, and then you can see if you can see if you get the right answer. Okay. And so before we move on to assembly, and so if you're not done yet, you know don't don't worry about it. You know, um, probably in all likelihood, and probably for myself too, I, I probably made a mistake somewhere here, um, and so you're gonna have to go back and kind of check this again later. But last thing I want to say is that you know before we exit the loop. You can see that we we multiply the entire element stiffness matrix by E over L, okay, and that takes care of the um, that takes care of the um, of the coefficient out front, okay. Um, oh, and if you've never seen these uh, these used before in MATLAB, so if you're not familiar with MATLAB syntax, uh, what these colons mean is that colons mean Uh, so the colon basically means that it's uh, you're asking MATLAB to um, apply this to all everything in this dimension. Okay. 
And so for this particular line, you know, we're multiplying the elements, the entire element stiffness matrix, all six by six terms, uh, 36 by E over L. And so that's why we're doing a, a K element colon comma colon at I E L. And then we multiply that by E over L. Okay. Okay. All right. And so, you know, before, before we go today, I want to talk about assembly um, or at least, you know, start talking about assembly. Um, Cause I think this is, this is probably the part that I think most people will, will struggle with. And so I want to make sure that we, we, we start talking about it, um, you know, just so that we can, um, you know, just so that we kind of get off on the right foot on one Monday. Okay. And so at this point in the code, you know, once you kind of reach this point and assuming that you've, you know, you filled in all the, all the entries here. Okay. Once we kind of reach this point in the code, all of the element stiffness matrices will have been computed. Okay. And so when you reach this part of the code, you know, the next step that you have to do is you have to stick all these element stiffness matrices into the correct places into the, uh, into the global, into the global system. Right. And so in other words, we call this step assembly. Um, and so when we do this, you know, we kind of do this and kind of, you know, we do it kind of step by step. And so, you know, we do this, you know, first of all, element by element. And so we start with, you know, the first element and we insert it into the appropriate locations. Okay. Uh, but a big part of this is determining, you know, what are the proper locations for us to, you know, to, to insert these elements in. Okay. Right. And so if you remember from the beginning of class today, we defined a vector called connectivity. Right. And so that connectivity told us, you know, which, uh, which element or which entries or which locations, sorry, which nodes each of our elements are connected to, right? And so for our element one or element A, remember that was connected to nodes one and two, right? And so we had connectivity one and two, okay? And so the first thing that you'll notice in this assembly matrix is that I'm referencing this connectivity, okay? And so what this line of code does, and so you can read the tooltip here where it says, I retrieve the node numbers that are connected to this element, okay? And so N1 here is gonna be connectivity at IEL, where IEL here, you can see it here is our loop index, right? And so we're looping over all of the, we're looping over all of the elements, okay? And in particular, I'm getting the first column, okay? And so this N1 here, this is gonna be the first node ID that is connected to this element, okay? Whereas N2, you can see that I'm referencing the connectivity matrix for the IEL row, but for the second column, okay? And so this is the second node ID that is connected to this element, okay? What? No, go away, okay. Right, and so for, you know, let's say, let's say that we're doing this on the first iteration of the loop, right? And so we're doing this for element one, that means, Okay, so for the first iteration of the loop for element one, that means N1 here is going to be one, right? Because no, element one is, is uh, connected to node one. And N2 is going to equal to two, right? Right, because element one is connected to nodes one and two. Okay. If we do the same, and so if we go, if we could kind of continue on, and so for the second iteration of the loop, element two, okay, for element two, you know, element two is connected to nodes two and three. And so here N1 is gonna to equal to two and N2 is gonna to equal to three, okay? And so all we're doing is we're kind of leveraging the connectivity information that we defined earlier to get the proper nodes that are connected to our, to our elements, okay? Okay. Um, so any questions on how we're using this connectivity matrix here and kind of how we're, how we're using it to uh, obtain the information that we, that we need? Okay. Okay. And so the next thing that we need to do is we need to, we need to compute um, the starting locations for each of the, locate, for, each of the um, for each of these nodes. Okay. And so let me, let me kind of dive through that a little bit more. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, this is, this is a typical element stiffness matrix for a frame, right? So here is our six by six element stiffness matrix. Okay? And we know that these are going to be acting on, you know, node one. This is, in this case, this is for element one. So element one, this is nodes one and two. And so we have u1x, u1y, theta one, 
U2X, U2Y theta two, and then we have the same entries for, for the columns, right? Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, maybe you, maybe you've noticed this already, but you know, as you've been going through the problems, what you'll see is that, you know, most of the element stiffness matrices, um, you know, and this is true for the trusses as well, you kind of break it up into these four, I call them quadrants. Okay. And so whenever you insert these into the global stiffness matrix, this quadrant kind of sticks together, right? This quadrant kind of always sticks together. This quadrant always sticks together. And then this quadrant always sticks together as well, right? They may, they may not be, they might not, they may not be next to each other. You know, they might be scattered. And so this might go into the top, the top left entry, and this might go into the top right. But these clusters always kind of stick together. Okay. And so, you know, let's let's kind of use that structure in assembling our our matrix. Okay. And so the way I've kind of structured this code is I've kind of done it kind of quadrant by quadrant. Okay, because we can see here that there are four blocks of code, uh, and I've, I I filled in kind of the first the first one for you, and partially the second one. Okay, and I want you to fill in kind of the third and the fourth one. Okay, so let's look at kind of this first one first, right? And so this first one is for the top left quadrant or the top left three by three part of the element stiffness matrix, and we're going to insert this into the global the global system. Okay. And so if we look at this top left quadrant of the element stiffness matrix, you can see here that it's, you can kind of think of it as like the, the node one, node one location, right? Because the rows of this matrix correspond to U1, X, U1, Y, and theta one. And the columns also correspond to U1, X, U1, Y, theta one, okay? And so this is gonna go into, you know, the, um, all those corresponding entries into the global stiffness system, okay? And so if you remember, if you remember this formula that we had before, okay, this formula, which we which we used to compute um, the rows and by by extension the columns of the global stiffness matrix for that uh, for those degrees of freedom, right? Let's use that same thing here, right? Okay. And so you know now that we know n one n two, so n one n two, those are the nodes that these elements are connected to. Let's use that to compute what I like to call the starting locations in the in the global stiffness matrix. Okay, um, and so and so node um, element one is kind of you know not really that useful. So let's do this for element two. Okay, okay. So element two, element two is is with regards to nodes two and three, right? And so if I draw the global stiffness matrix here, let's say u one x, u one y, theta one. U2x, U2y, theta 2, right? And yada, yada, yada. Right. Okay. And so since element two here is, is for nodes two and three, right? This tells us that the location where we're going to start inserting stuff is going to be for U2x, right? And so that means we're going to start on the fourth column and the fourth row. Why am I writing this? I just type it. And so for, for element two, we need to start inserting at the fourth row and fourth column of the global stiffness system. Okay. And so this four here is really significant, okay? Because that tells us where we need to start inserting. Okay? And so these I and D, so I and D one, I and D two, this tells us kind of where we need to start, you know, the insert. Okay. And so for N1 here, okay, so N1 here is two. And so in order to compute, you know, in order to tell MATLAB that we need to look at the fourth, the fourth row, okay, let's use our formula that we did before, you know, for the index for the X component. Okay. And so you can see here that I have the uh, the code here for IND one is equal to one plus three times N one. Remember N one is the nodal ID for you know uh, for the node that's connected to this element minus one. Okay. And so if you plug this in for element two, for element two here N one is two. What we get is four 
for element two. Right? And so this tells us that you know, for element two, we need to start inserting at the fourth row and the fourth, the fourth column. Okay. All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on that? Okay. So let's do the same thing for IND2. So IND2 will be the same thing, but for, you know, for the second row. And so we're gonna use the same formula. And so we're gonna do one plus three times, okay. but instead of N1, what we're gonna have instead is N2. Okay, so we're going to have the one plus three times n two uh, minus one. Okay. All right. All right. So here's here's where things get a little bit uh, a little bit tricky. And so um, you know this part. You know, if you have to kind of read over this part several times, then you know um, you might you might you might have to you might have to. And that's uh, you know, and that's that's okay because the logic for this is a little bit hard to to understand. Okay. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to take, you know, first of all, we're going to take our element stiffness matrix. And so you can see here that I've, I've created a variable KE. Okay. And so all this KE here is, KE is just our element stiffness matrix for this, for this element. Okay. And so I kind of saved it into a, into a vector here just to kind of make it a little bit more convenient. Okay. okay. And so let me kind of return back to the, to the slides here to kind of talk about my logic here. Okay. Okay. And so remember how I talked about that we, we assemble these matrices kind of quadrant by quadrant, right? So we start with the top left quadrant and we, we put this into the global stiffness matrix and we go to the top right one and the bottom left and the um, you know, bottom right. One, okay. Let's pretend for now that this is for element two because I think it, it makes it a little bit more interesting. Okay. So let's assume that all these are two right here. And these, of course, are going to be three. Okay. All right. And so for element two here, you know, we we know that this quadrant is going to go into the u two x u two y theta two rows and columns of our global stiffness matrix. Okay. And so starting for this entry right here, right. We know that this needs to be inserted into the four four slot of the global stiffness system, right? Okay. Whereas this entry right here, this is going to go into the four comma five slot, and this entry here is going to be in four comma six. But you know these also have locations in the uh, in the element stiffness matrix as well, right? And so even though we know that this goes into the four four slot of the of the global stiffness system, in the element stiffness matrix, this is the first row first column. And so this is one comma one in the element stiffness matrix. This is one comma two in the element stiffness matrix. This is one comma three. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay. And so let me just let me just take this this entry here just as a uh, as an example, okay. And so you know, following that logic, we we know that the one comma two entry in the element stiffness matrix, right? The location that we're going to put this in in the global system is going to be four comma five. And if you kind of follow that same logic for all the other entries here, you can see that it actually follows quite a pattern. Okay, and so let's see how that pattern is kind of encoded here into the uh, into the code. So actually, let me kind of leave this here just so you know, just so we can always have it. So one two is four five element, and this is blob. Okay, all right. So let's see how this let's see how this logic is applied into our code. Right. And so that logic is going to be right here. Okay. Remember, remember, IND one is four for this element because remember that's what we're that's where we know we're going to start. Okay. And so let's kind of read off this line of code right here and say what it uh, what it reads. Okay. And so you can see here that we're referencing K glob. Remember K glob. K glob is our global our global stiffness matrix. Okay. 
And so what we say is that k glob at ind1, comma, ind1 plus one, right? Remembering that ind1 here is four, right? And so k glob at four comma five, right? So it's four comma five here, is equal to k glob, the same thing, okay? So four comma five plus ke, where ke here, remember, is our element stiffness matrix, okay? At one comma two. And so what we've done here is that we, we said, we're, what we're saying is that, you know, for the four or five entry of the global matrix, we're going to add to it whatever the one, two entry is in our element system. Okay. Okay. And then that same logic can be applied for everything else in this quadrant, right? And so you can see here, there are, line, there are nine lines of code, one for each of the quadrants in here. So the first quadrant is given by, you know, one comma one, one, two, one, three, and then two comma one, two comma two, two comma three, Three comma one, three comma two, three comma three. Okay, and you can see here that I've inserted them into the appropriate locations in the global system, based on this int variable that I that I've defined. Okay, and so everything here is based on every the locations here are based on those int int variables. Okay, and that's important because you know remember we're doing this for every single element, and so we can't just say we can't just say four and five here. Okay because that's only gonna work for one particular element. And we want this code to work for all the elements, you know, kind of at the same time as we loop through all of them, okay? And so that's why I did everything in terms of I and Bs. And so if you kind of follow the same logic, right? And so if you look at, you know, let's look at this one, for instance, okay? And so I and D one here is four. And so for, for this one, and so we have five comma six, okay? And the global one, right? So that's I and D plus one and I and D plus two. We can see that the element stiffness entry that goes there is the two comma three, right? Okay. Right. Uh, so does that so does that does that kind of make sense about you know how I kind of chose the logic for the INTs at the element stiffness matrices here? It takes it's I know it's it's this is probably the part that's kind of hardest to understand here, and and I, and I think we'll we'll pick this up again on Monday and kind of explain the logic, but. Um, if you kind of, if you kind of, you know, have these two cases in mind, for, you say that, you know, for a given element, you know, where does this, where does this entry of the element stiffness matrix, where does that get inserted into the global one, okay? And if you kind of, if you kind of write out all of these relationships, relationships here, you'll, you'll probably start to see that there's a pattern, okay? And then all I've done here is that I've taken that pattern and I've kind of encapsulated that in code so that it kind of works for all, for all of the elements, okay? But we'll, we'll talk about this again on Monday because I think it, it bears, you know, it, I think it, it, uh, it deserves a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more time for us to talk about it because this, this is kind of a key part of the program that I think most people kind of generally um, kind of struggle with. Okay. All right. So any final questions before we wrap it up for the week? Okay. All right. So on Monday, we'll, 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 we'll keep working on this code. Um, you know, we're, we're just about done. And so there, there's actually not that much more after this. Uh, we've done most of the work for the boundary conditions already, and so you know that's going to be pretty quick. Kind of the the big the big hurdle in this code is definitely going to be the assembly. But once you get the assembly, then a lot of the code kind of falls into place. After. Yeah, yeah. So after so after Monday, so I don't want to post it too soon because uh, you know because uh, you know we're still going to be working on Monday. But after after Monday, uh, after Monday, I'll post the I'll post the full the full correct code. Yeah. The review is on Friday, right? Yeah. What time is that at? Uh, so it's it's not going to be live, and so it's going to be asynchronous. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pre-record it, and then I'll upload on YouTube, and I'll send I'll send them. Okay. Yeah. 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 Definitely for this code, you know, I, I know it's an activity, but you know, I'm definitely gonna upload the solutions for it so that you can use it because you know what you'll see if you scroll down to the end. So we're doing this for a frame, and I and I think the frame is kind of the worst the worst kind of case for this. Um, oh. I don't have it here, but but there's uh, but for your homework assignment, uh, and this is going to be not until after the midterm. And so you know, the, for the next thing on your, I know the, the thing on everyone's mind is the midterm, but after the midterm, the next big assignment is to implement this code for a two D truss. Okay, uh, and so a truss is is not going to be as bad as the frame. So the truss has a lot less computations, but you could follow the exact same structure. So understanding the logic of this code is going to be really important for that for that assignment. All right, so thank you guys for tuning in this week. I uh, hope you guys, you know, uh, good luck, best of luck studying this weekend. If you have any questions about anything, you know, don't please don't hesitate to reach out and I'll see you guys next week.
uh, well, we have a copy of the format. Uh, yeah, you could just use the same format as this code yeah, for, for the trust one. Yeah. I, I don't remember if I have a starter code for that one, but if I do, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to upload that as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, per professor, what I... Oh, oh, sorry, there's a question in class first. Let me answer that first, and then I'll, I'll come back to you. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, there will not be frame questions. Okay. So I, I wrote it. I wrote it today, and there's definitely no frame. There's okay. definitely no frame. Yeah. So there, there is a conceptual question about frames. So make sure you know you understand the conceptual stuff with frames. But but there's no computations with involving frames because it's yeah it's 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 ridiculous. And so that's you know that's too much torture for one day. <laughs> Does that mean there's two beams and two trusses, or two or two beams one truss like that type of thing? There is a one D problem with trusses and springs. There is a two D truss problem, and then there is a beam problem. Uh, professors, so uh, I just wanted to clarify. Um, I, I know it's a, a week or two away still. Um, I just meant for that homework problem where we have to do a, a code for the for the trusses. Yep. Um, would are you going to make us copy like fill in um, uncompleted code, or can we just do our own from scratch? Because I I prefer oh, to just do I my mean own. Yeah, if, if you prefer to do your own, I would say go for it. And so, okay. yeah, don't you don't have to wait for me. Um, and so I know, I know, you know, I have my own kind of coding style, but uh, but if you're used to coding a different way, then by all means, um, I, I would I would ask that you kind of keep just kind of this general structure of like you know one loop for the element stiffness matrix, one loop for the assembly, and for the boundary condition, because because our, our final project is going to build off this too. Um, but if you have kind of, if you want to kind of you know do the loops a different way, then that's that's fine with me. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh wait, what did you ask earlier? Oh, the the oh the the. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's 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 a one D problem with trusses and springs. There's a two D truss problem, and then there is a beam problem. As well as there's there's conceptual problems too, and so make sure you know those. Yeah, so no no frame computations on the exam. That's 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 too cruel. Yeah. Three A you do, three B you do not. Do. Okay. Yeah. So three B you can test your code. So that's that that'll be a good test case for the code. Uh, but you don't have to do that by hand. That was that was a good test. Yeah. Have a good weekend, guys. Thanks. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Good night.